All right, so let me begin by, on behalf of the, the co-organizers, uh, Catherine Tucker, Avi Goldfarb, and Joshua Gans, uh, welcome everybody uh, to Toronto. Uh, and perhaps to set some context, uh, <clears throat> how did we get here? Uh, how did we get to a conference focused on the economics of machine intelligence uh, and, uh, and located in Toronto? One reasonable starting point uh, is possibly the 1956 Dartmouth Conference, uh, <coughs> which the, was described in the proposal as an attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, uh, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves, in other words, to learn. We think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. <laughs> uh, Fifty years later, uh, this plaque was erected at Dartmouth, uh, referencing the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. First use of the term artificial intelligence, founding of artificial intelligence as a research discipline uh, to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And at this time in 2006, uh, there was a fair amount of uh, work in terms of a resurgence in this area. So over the 50 years, of course, it been a couple of AI winters, uh, but there was a new dawn uh, which was largely associated with a subfield of machine learning. Uh, some of that pioneering work happened uh, here at the University of Toronto. Uh, a number of papers and, and uh, the three people uh, who this year, earlier this year, were awarded with the Turing Prize, uh, which is effectively the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, uh, were doing uh, their work uh, at Toronto and, uh, and related universities, at, now at uh, Yann LeCun at NYU and Yasha Bengio at University of Montreal, Jeff Hinton is still here. And in fact, Jeff Hinton is either here now or will be here shortly. And what's interesting is that today we can trace the lineage of many of the most powerful corporate AI initiatives uh, back to the computer science department, which is two blocks down the road from here. Uh, so the person who founded and headed uh, the uh, Facebook AI research group, Yan LeCun, was previously Toronto. The person who heads AI research for Apple in Cupertino, Russell Kudinoff, uh, formerly Toronto. The person who heads uh, research at OpenAI, uh, Ilya Suskiver, uh, formerly Toronto. Uh, the person who heads the autonomous driving unit at Uber, Raquel Erdison, Toronto. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the spiritual leaders of machine intelligence at Google is uh, Jeff Hinton, Toronto. Uh, one of the leaders of the autonomous driving group at uh, Tesla, Andre Carpathy, uh, spent time at Toronto, and so on. And two blocks up the road from the computer science department is the business school where Joshua Gans, uh, Avi, and I uh, work at this thing called the, uh, the Creative Destruction Lab, a program that we founded uh, to uh, support science, 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 uh, scientists, uh, and engineer inventors uh, who want to turn their science projects into scalable and financeable businesses. And in 2012, the first graduate student uh, came up the road to our lab. Uh, his name was Abe Heifetz. And he ha had a proposal of how to use this new form of machine intelligence to predict which molecules would most effectively bind with which proteins in a way that he hypothesized could transform drug discovery. Uh, and you'll be hearing from him today at lunch. And subsequently, Vinod Kosla came and put 45 million bucks into his idea, which for a separate conference in economic geography, the interesting story there is he would only do so if he picked up and moved his entire team to the Bay, uh, which he did, since no Canadians would finance that business at that time. Anyhow, a series of uh, similar graduate students, another graduate student came, she wanted to take video data to use it in a car assembly plant and use this, t this machine learning technique to predict which cars um, 
had defects before they rolled off the assembly line. Another graduate student came and he wanted to use the same technique for looking at credit card transactions to predict you know, thousands of these things flying by per second to predict which ones were fraudulent in real time. Another graduate student came and she wanted to use the same technique for looking at the pixels in a medical image to predict which tumors uh, were malignant versus benign. And eventually, this started as a trickle, turned into a flood. And Avi, Joshua, and I uh, right, took the view that this wasn't normal. There was something unusual about what was happening with this technology. And so uh, we drew some inspiration from uh, you know, prior conferences, in particular uh, the Radiant Direction Conference and the 50-year uh, revisiting of that, uh, led by Scott Stern and Josh Lerner. And we said, Should we, wouldn't it be interesting to do something similar uh, in machine intelligence? And so we talked to Jim Perturba and uh, Ian Coburn, Scott Stern, Shane Greenstein, and asked for their advice, what they thought, and they said, you know, it's worth a try. So we sent out a series of emails uh, to a, a number of economists, many of whom are in the room, uh, asking if they would be interested to engage in effectively uh, the, DART, the economics version of the Dartmouth conference. And so this is an example of one of those emails. It was written to Paul Milgram by Joshua Gans. So he's inviting Paul, and in it, he's trying to explain what we're trying to do. He says, the economists, we're going to invite a small group of economists uh, here to Toronto to talk about economics and machine intelligence. The economists will be focused on laying out a research agenda for the economics of AI. The context, uh, imagine back to 1995 when the internet was about to become a thing. What would have happened to economic research into that revolution had the leading economists gathered to scope out a research agenda at that time? Today, we are facing the same opportunity with regards to AI. This time around, we are organizing a group of 30 economists to scope out the research agenda for the next 20 years into the economics of AI. Our intention is to have 12 talks on various aspects of the agenda from historical context to short and long-term impacts. We had no idea if anybody would be willing to engage in this exercise, um, but we sent out the emails anyways just to see. And to our amazement, uh, almost everybody said yes. Here's an example response. This one's from Paul Milgram, uh, who wrote back, Joshua, yes. I remember vividly in 1990 uh, when the NSF asked me whether I might be interested in working on the economics of the internet. And I was too busy working on principal agent theory, the economics of the firm, and supermodularity. So I declined. Ugh. No excuses this time. Yes, I'll be there. And so we gathered in, uh, this time two years ago in 2017. And uh, people presented, each person presented what uh, effectively their view of uh, uh, what were the primary research questions with respect to AI and their area of expertise. And those papers uh, we brought together and uh, put into a volume along with a few other papers that were not presented at the conference but by people who attended the conference and were inspired to contribute a chapter. Many of the papers that you're going to see today and tomorrow are uh, papers that have already started to work against the agenda that was outlined uh, in this volume. Why are we having a conference specifically on economics and machine intelligence? Uh, many of the papers in this volume address that, but I think two stand out uh, more than the others in terms of making the case for why AI deserves this uh, level of attention. Uh, one was by Ian, Rebecca, and Scott. And what they did here was they effectively, first of all, drew upon Zvi Grilich's work on hybrid corn and, and his insight of an invention in the method of inventing. And so they pointed out that machine intelligence has this property. But unlike Zvi's study of hybrid corn, they said that you know, hybrid corn and the, the underlying science apply to one sector, agriculture. Whereas what we were seeing in machine intelligence was not only an IMI, but also a general purpose technology because it had this implication across multiple sectors. The other paper, which came very late on the second day of the conference in 2017, was from uh, a remark by, uh, in some sense, the person we least expected. We wanted to make sure that this conference was focused on economics of AI and, and was uh, devoid of the hype associated around the technology. So we. We're careful to pick papers that we thought um, uh, were sensible on this. And then uh, pro perhaps one of the, the, the elder statesmen of that conference uh, surprised us right at the end of the conference with his closing remarks that went like this. A well-known novelist wrote to me some time ago that he's planning a novel. 
The novel is about a love triangle between two humans and a robot, and what he wanted to know is how would the robot be different from the people. I propose three main differences. One is obvious, the robot would be much better at statistics and less enamored with stories. The other is the robot would have a much higher emotional intelligence. The third, the robot would be wiser. Wisdom is breadth. Wisdom is not having too narrow a view. That is the essence of wisdom. It's broad framing. A robot will be endowed with broad framing. I say that when it has learned enough, it will be wiser than we people because we do not have broad framing. We are narrow thinkers, we are noisy thinkers, and it is very easy to improve upon us. I do not think there is very much that we can do that computers will not eventually learn to do.